Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 14, Non-Renewable Energy Resources. So we spoke uh, in the previous uh, part, part one, uh, we spoke about oil and we spoke about natural gas. And now today uh, we're going to talk about coal and we're going to talk about nuclear energy. So first, coal, what are the advantages and disadvantages of coal? And what we're gonna talk about with coal, which is very interesting, is that coal, You'll notice it right here, has a very high net energy yield. So in fact, when we talk about coal, coal uh, is actually a very efficient form of energy. The problem is, we're going to learn, is that it's also the dirtiest uh, form of energy when it comes to uh, in, in environmental pollution, uh, and that's why we really need to get away from coal. But again, uh, conventional coal is plentiful. It's all over the place. It has a high net energy yield, okay? Its cost is low. All right, but using it has high environmental impact. So that's basically uh, coal in a nutshell right there. We can also produce gaseous and liquid fuels from coal. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, towards the end of this section. Uh, they do have lower net energy yields, uh, and they even have more uh, higher environmental impacts uh, uh, than, than, uh, than, than conventional coal. All right, so again, we'll talk about this stuff as we go through. So once again, we have our favorite chart here are trade-offs, advantages, and disadvantages of coal. So again, as we've been doing in this course, just make sure you understand a few advantages and a few disadvantages. So again, advantages, ample supplies in many countries, medium to high net energy, all right, uh, and low cost when environmental costs are not included. What are your disadvantages? Well, severe land disturbances and water pollution to get the coal out of the ground, fine particle and toxic mercury emissions threaten human health, and coal emits large amounts of CO2, large amounts of that carbon dioxide and other air pollutants when it is produced and when it is burned, okay? So these are the pros and cons uh, when it comes to coal. So again, coal is plentiful, but it is a dirty fuel. So coal, uh, solid fossil fuel, that's formed from the remains of land plants. So that's what actually produces coal. Uh, plants on land die, and then over millions and millions of years, uh, those plants uh, are, are, are compressed, are, 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 are disintegrated, obviously, uh, and they're turned into coal. Coal is burned in power plants, all right, generated 40% of the world's electricity in 2015, all right? So five years ago, six years ago or so, uh, about 40% of the world's electricity was produced in coal-burning power plants. Well, who are the largest consumers of coal? China, the United States, and India. So, uh, moving on, uh, the environmental costs of burning coal, again, are very, very large. So mining, first of all, uh, mining coal severely degrades the land, okay? Uh, water and air pollution, again, soot and carbon dioxide from burning that uh, burning that coal. What is soot? Those are, that's that fine particles, okay, that, that end up getting into the air. Uh, and we have trace amounts of mercury and other radioactive materials uh, that are released into the atmosphere when coal is burned. Scrubbers remove some pollutants before they leave smokestacks. So scrubbers are uh, special components inside of smokestacks that, that, that trap uh, some of this soot, some of this carbon dioxide, some of this uh, trace amounts of mercury and radioactive materials. Uh, but it produces something called coal ash that then must be safely stored. So uh, we talk about how these scrubbers remove some of the pollutants, but the uh, product of the scrubbers are something that we call coal ash. And that has to be safely stored because, unfortunately, uh, it has all the toxic chemicals in it. Uh, that's why it was uh, that's why it was taken out uh, before uh, it was allowed to uh, to allow to leave the smokestack uh, and go into the atmosphere. So there's actually uh, some different types of coal out there. Uh, and again, uh, we'll kind of start. Uh, and it depends on the moisture content, all right? So we'll start from uh, with that has the most moisture. And actually, it's not coal. It's something called peat, all right? And if you uh, have ever gone to Ireland, I, I never have, or northern Scotland, uh, they actually, in the past, and even some people nowadays, uh, actually burn peat. They actually cut it out of the ground. Uh, you don't have to mine to get peat, okay? Actually, in Scotland, northern Scotland, and in parts of Ireland, uh, you can kind of just cut it. 
okay, out of the ground, uh, and you bring it home, and you actually burn it in your stove, and it works. So what is peat? Again, it's not coal, technically. Uh, it's partially decayed plant matter in swamps and bogs. Uh, it does have a low heat content, and it does have any a high moisture content, okay? So you'll notice as we go from left to right, we're going to be decreasing uh, the moisture but we're going to be increasing the heat and carbon content. So the next one uh, is something called uh, lignite or brown coal. Uh, this is, as again, has a low heat content, low uh, sulfur content, and there's limited supplies of this lignite in most areas. Then we move on, okay, increasing heat and pressure, and we get bitumous coal, which we call soft coal, extensively used as a fuel because of its high heat content and large supplies. Normally, household, though, has a high sulfur content and then at the end here, anthracite, which is called hard coal, okay, a highly desirable fuel because of its high heat content and low sulfur content. However, supplies are limited in most areas. So most of the coal that is burned is the bitumous coal, all right, but we kind of want to try to find that anthracite coal if we want to continue with coal because the anthracite coal is a little, little cleaner, has a lower sulfur content, uh, but it is uh, limited. Uh, supplies of that are are limited, okay? And again, as we went from left to right, we decreased the moisture and we increased the heat and the carbon content of the coal. So this, uh, this map here is showing uh, the carbon dioxide emissions as a percent uh, that is uh, put out into the atmosphere. And you'll notice coal-fired electricity. So uh, power plants that use coal to produce electricity, 286% of your carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, synthetic oil and gas that is produced from coal, 150%. Coal itself, right at 100, right? That makes sense, right? Okay, so uh, coal burning itself is kind of the baseline, 100%. If you use synthetic oil or gas produced from coal, we'll talk about that in a little bit, 150. Coal to produce electricity, 286%. Again, this is the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. All right, the tar sand, the oil we talked about uh, in the previous uh, previous part to this chapter. Again, a little less. And you'll notice nuclear fuel and geothermal uh, release, releases the least amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And again, we'll talk about geothermal when we talk about renewable energy resources, which will be coming up uh, in the next chapter. Uh, all right, so... We are not paying the full cost of using coal. So right now, people are using coal a lot still because it is very cheap, because it's a, it's plentiful. But again, we're not putting in that full cost pricing, and that's why coal is so cheap. Because if we put in the full cost pricing, if we spoke about or, or put in the, the, the environmental impacts from mining coal and burning coal, uh, then coal would be much, much more expensive. So harmful environmental and health costs not included in the market price of coal-generated electricity. So ways that we can implement full cost pricing, all right? Phase out subsidies and tax breaks, all right? Many of these power plants get subsidies and tax breaks phase them out, uh, require stricter air pollution controls, tax the CO2 emissions. This is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting uh, tactic here to basically tax the amount of carbon dioxide you put in the air. So if your country, of your country, if your company wants to put in 25 tons of carbon dioxide, and you have another company that only putting in 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide into the air, if you're taxing it, well, then obviously the company putting 25,000 tons into the air will uh, have lower profits than the company putting 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide into the air, okay? So actually taxing those carbon dioxide emissions could help, uh, again, kind of, kind of, see that full cost uh, 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 pricing of the coal or, or even regulate coal ash as a hazardous waste right now it's not uh, but you could do that uh, and that could help as well so what is the future of coal well I'm hoping we don't use it as much anymore even though it is obviously uh, a cheap way to uh, to uh, power things uh, again it's just so dirty so US coal use dropped 18 percent between 2007 and 2013 because of increased competition from natural gas, wind, and solar power, and because of a grassroots political opposition to uh, how dirty coal is. Natural gas should overtake coal as the largest electricity source here in the U.S. by the 2030s. Uh, U.S. coal producers are exporting the coal, because again, we're not using it as much here in the U.S., uh, because use is expanding in India, Africa, and Asia. And here again is that yin-yang we talk about, okay? We have developing countries. Who's to tell India? 
who's to tell obviously Africa and Asia are continents, but who's to tell developing countries in Africa, hey, look, your people can't, we're not going to allow them to have cheap electricity because of coal, because it's bad for the environment. Uh, so you guys are going to have to figure out a way to, uh, to get electricity to your people in, in a more expensive way. How can we tell people that? But then again, how can we, on the other hand, uh, not tell people that by burning coal, you're destroying the environment, not only the air, but uh, the ground of the biodiversity to get this coal out of the ground. All right. Uh, the mining, for instance. So, again, this is some of the yin yangs that we have to talk about in environmental science. Uh, again, coal, very dirty. OK, but also very cheap, uh, very. And you have a high net energy. OK, high net energy yield from coal. So, again, that's kind of that's kind of where we are uh, when we talk about the future of coal. Now, again, we could convert coal into gaseous and liquid fuels. So conversion of solid coal to something called a, a sin fuels. All right. Synthetic natural gas, SNG, by coal gasification, a methanol or synthetic gasoline by coal liquefaction. All right. Uh, producing uh, sin fuels require mining of 50 percent more coal, however, and it has a lower net energy and costs more to produce than coal. So, again, we can convert this coal to gaseous and liquid fuels, the SNG. All right. Or the uh, methanol or synthetic gasoline. But you need 50 percent more coal to do it. And it's basically a, a, a lower net energy yield. So I'm uh, not exactly sure why we would want to do that. Uh, we're taking more coal out of the ground, more mining to produce something that has a lower net energy yield, but it's still just as dirty. So, again, maybe not something that we want to do. Here are, though, we are our favorite, uh, here's our favorite chart with our uh, advantages and disadvantages of these synthetic fuels that are made from coal. So advantages, large potential supply in many countries. Again, how can you tell a country that has a lot of this stuff, you can't use it, okay? It can be used for vehicle fuel. It can lower air, it has a little bit lower air pollution than coal. So even though we need more of it, okay, it's slightly less air pollution, okay? But what are the disadvantages? Low to medium net energy, while regular coal is medium to high, okay? Again, it requires 50% more coal with increased land disturbance, water pollution, and water use. And it has higher carbon dioxide emissions than coal. So, again, that may seem a little uh, uh, contradictory there. Lower air pollution than coal, meaning it may have less sulfur uh, and may have some of those uh, less of those toxic elements. But the disadvantage is, is it has higher carbon dioxide. So to me, uh, not sure that converting coal to gaseous and liquid fuels is, is a right thing to do. Seems to be a lose lose situation here. Uh, but obviously, there are some advantages to synthetic fuels. So definitely have uh, have again few disadvantages, few advantages uh, in the back of your mind. All right, so that's coal again. High net energy yield, cheap all over the place, but very, very dirty, okay, and very bad for the environment. All right, we're now going to move on to talking about nuclear power. So as always, we have advantages and disadvantages when we talk about using nuclear power. So nuclear power has a low environmental impact and a very low accident risk, believe it or not. Okay, I know you hear uh, we have an in, we have a power uh, nuclear power plant just about uh, 15 miles up the road, the Indian Point uh, nuclear power plant that sits on the Hudson River in Buchanan uh, here in Westchester County. Okay, uh, and look. Uh, you're going to hear you hear a lot of stuff about nuclear power. We obviously have had some nuclear meltdowns. Uh, the Fukushima plant, uh, which we'll look at a, at a core case study a little bit uh, later on here in in, in the lecture, uh, was a, was an issue. But in most cases, uh, nuclear power plants do have low environmental impact, and they really have very low accident risk. Okay, because there are a lot of nuclear plants out there, and you're not hearing about them uh, uh, having meltdowns uh, every single day. So, what are some drawbacks, though? What are some uh, negatives? Well, there's a low net energy yield when it comes to nuclear power because it is going to cost uh, is going to cost a lot. And there you go. High cost. OK, there is, of course, that fear of accidents, which can uh, obviously decimate an area uh, if you do have a, uh, uh, a nuclear meltdown. OK, the radioactive waste that are produced by a, a nuclear plant are, are long lived. So we have to uh, find a place to store this stuff for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and it, unfortunately, there's a role uh, in the spread of nuclear weapons technology, uh, which obviously uh, we don't want want to uh, have to deal with. So how does a nuclear fission reactor work? All right. 
So, once again, you got to remember, or maybe you remember back from Earth science, nuclear fusion is how the sun produces energy, and that's by fusing two lighter elements like hydrogen together to form helium. Well, nuclear fission is the opposite. Nuclear fission takes a heavier element like helium and breaks it apart into lighter elements like hydrogen. So fission is the opposite. It's breaking up. Of, uh, of, uh, of different elements into, into uh, heavier elements into lighter elements, okay? Uh, we have something called light water reactors. Uh, they boil water to produce steam that spins a turbine. Uh, the, and this is all fueled by uranium ore mined from the Earth's crust. A rich uranium packed as pellets into these fuel rods and these fuel assemblies. Uh, and then we control the, the rods. These control rods then uh, end up absorbing the, the uh, neutrons. Uh, of these of these elements okay so water is the usual coolant in any uh, nuclear plant because nuclear plants get very hot so you need water in there to cool it contaminant uh, shell around the core for protection so there's some kind of containment uh, shell that is put around the, the nuclear core uh, in order to not allow any toxic waste to get out uh, there's an emergency core cooling system as well typical cost to construct nine to eleven billion dollars so once again this is why it has a, a lower net energy yield, because it costs a lot of money uh, to get these plants up and running. United States, France, and Russia are the leading producers, or at least were the leading producers uh, of nuclear power back in, 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 in 2014. So once again, here is nuclear fission. Okay, what happens? We have a uranium atom here. Okay, they fire neutrons into it. Okay, the uranium atom then breaks up, okay, into these smaller, uh, smaller, uh, lighter elements, with, which then releases tremendous amounts of energy, all right? So that breaking up of these elements from a heavier element, uranium, to lighter elements uh, produces uh, an incredible amount of, uh, of energy, okay? And that's basically how these nuclear fission reactors work. So again, if you kind of look at here, uh, what do we have? Well, we have, here's the uranium fuel input. Here's the reactor core, all right? And here's your containment shell around it. And you have this uh, reactor core in here. And then what happens? You basically have water that comes in here with a pump, okay? Uh, it ends up uh, producing, the water obviously gets very, very hot because of the energy produced in the nuclear core, uh, and that then produces steam. Steam then goes up through a pipe here and then basically runs a turbine, which is how water, uh, how electricity is generated. And then, of course, we have the waste, all right? That hot water uh, is then released either into, the, uh, into any nearby lakes or rivers for our sake, for instance instance, the Hudson River, or a lot of that waste heat is actually just wasted uh, into the environment. So we're going to talk about in a bit uh, how nuclear power has a large waste involved in it. And that's because uh, you have a lot of this heat here. While some of the heat is being uh, used to turn this turbine to produce the electricity, a lot of the heat is being either released back into the atmosphere, just wasted, or it's being put into uh, a nearby cooler body of water. Again, this hotter water uh, releasing the heat into that body of water uh, instead of using the heat to actually run the turbine. So there is a lot of waste uh, uh, when it comes to these nuclear fission reactors. So let's talk about the nuclear fuel cycle. Again, everything with environmental science, we have to talk about, again, how, and this is all that full cost pricing type of stuff, where, how, all the steps that it takes here. So first we have to mine the uranium, right? So that's going to uh, destroy or at least uh, degrade uh, uh, some, some, some of the environment that's near that mine. You then have to process and enrich the uranium to make the little fuel pellets that will go in the rods. You have to then use it in the reactor. You then have to safely store the radioactive waste that comes from the reactor. Uh, and then at some point, you have to retire the worn out plant, the power plant. Uh, and where do you store its high and moderate level radioactive parts safely? So again, these are the big issues when it comes to nuclear power. And again, here just is kind of uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, nuclear fuel cycle. Okay, your open fuel cycle today. Again, uh, here we have uh, the, the, the mine. Okay, uh, we have some low-level radiation here with a long half-life. This is your, uh, okay, your overburden, all right, from the mine, kind of the waste. Here, obviously, is your uranium going into the, going into the power plant or at least to the fuel fabrication here to enrich it. Then it goes into the reactor where it actually then uh, you have to temporarily store 
uh, any fuel assemblies underwater, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a way to geologically dispose of some moderate radioactive waste under the ground. All right, that's how we're doing it right now. Okay, well under the ground. Uh, and then again, you see some recycling of some nuclear fuel when you decommission the reactor, you gotta put everything underground, okay? Uh, and again, here's just some spent fuel rod uh, uh, reprocessing to maybe go back into the cycle. But basically, again, kind of your nuclear fuel cycle here. So just kind of understand in general uh, uh, these steps uh, in that nuclear fuel cycle. So once again, we have our favorite uh, chart here, our trade-offs from conventional nuclear fuel cycle, the advantages, low environmental impact without uh, accident. So obviously there's some environmental impact getting the, uh, getting the, mi getting the uh, uranium out of the mine, but after that, the actual impact is actually low, all right, as long as you don't have a, a, a nuclear meltdown. It emits only a sixth as much carbon dioxide as coal. So that's a huge advantage. Uh, and again, there's really low risk of accidents in modern plants. What's the disadvantage? Low net energy, okay? Not only does it cost a lot of money to produce, but you're going to have, we'll talk about more in a slide or two, uh, there's much more in the way of heat waste. So you do have a low net energy with nuclear fuel, the high overall cost we talked about. It does produce long-lived harmful radioactive waste that we have to do stuff with. And also it promotes the spread of nuclear weapons because the same technology uh, that is used to create electricity could also be used to create bombs. So Again, uh, some of the pros and cons of our conventional nuclear fuel cycle. So how do we deal with the radioactive nuclear waste? At least how are we dealing with them right now? Uh, nuclear rods must be replaced every three to four years. So they're stored in water-filled pools for several years to cool. So once the rods are not useful anymore, we put them in water-filled pools for several years to cool down. That's how hot they are. That's how radioactive they are. Needs, we need years for them to cool down. Then they're transferred to dry casks, where then uh, they can be processed to remove the plutonium. All right, reprocessing reduces storage time from Think about this, from 240,000 years to about 10,000 years. So if we were to process it in, and remove the plutonium, it's a little less radioactive. But you still need 10,000 years, okay, to store it somewhere, all right, before you can, you can touch it again, all right? And, and, it, costly, uh, and it costly and produces uh, uh, weapons, weapons material, all right? So again, no permanent secure repository exists today. Uh, there was the, the Nevada Yucca Mountain site. Uh, it was planned. The plan there was was abandoned uh, because the people in Nevada didn't want this stuff in their backyard. OK, so we actually don't have a permanent secure repository. These uh, these rods are being kind of moved around the country uh, and trying to be put in places where we have nothing permanent. Uh, and then again, when you retire these nuclear plants, it's an enormous cost because not only do you have to when you retire a nuclear plant, not only do you have to store the rods, but you pretty much got to store at, uh, store somewhere every part of the nuclear plant because every part of the nuclear plant has some radioactivity to it. So you have to store every part of it somewhere. Uh, so you actually have to dismantle and then put parts of these parts of, a, of the nuclear plant underground somewhere. And again, we don't even have a permanent, uh, a, a secure place right now. So these are kind of the issues uh, that we have with, with uh, nuclear power. Again, it is much cleaner than, let's say, coal or oil or natural gas, uh, but it doesn't have a high net energy yield because it costs a lot. And then we have to deal with all this radioactive material afterwards. And again, people don't want it in their backyards, understandably, but understandably, it obviously has to go somewhere. So can nuclear power slow climate change? That's the big question. Nuclear power plants really have no carbon dioxide emissions, okay? Uh, nuclear fuel cycle, though, will emit some carbon dioxide because, again, just getting this stuff around from the mining to transporting, you are going to, uh, in the cycle, you're going to emit carbon dioxide. But the power plants itself don't produce any, okay? Uh, cutting global carbon dioxide emissions in half between 2015 and 2040 and meeting the energy needs would require building 12,000 nuclear power reactors. Okay, this is according to a guy called Mark Linus, who is a climate change author. So the point is, by thinking about that, if you want to cut global emissions to half they are right now in the next uh, 20, uh, 20 years, okay, and you still meet the energy demands of the world, you would need 12,000 of these nuclear power plants. So again, is that a lot? Is that a little? I don't know. You know, I mean, that's kind of the cause that, you know, 12, 
12,000 if they're averaging $10 billion each. So you can do the math, how many billions of dollars will be needed to construct these plants. Okay, and where are the plants going? Well, who has the money for that? Mainly, right, developed countries like us. So the underdeveloped nations, well, you know, they may not be using that, uh, that they're still going to be using maybe coal or oil. Uh, so again, the point is here, maybe it's not slow, going to slow climate change as much as we thought maybe 20 or 30 years nuclear power would do. Um, so again, maybe it's not the way we need to go. Maybe it's more, again, when we talk about those renewable energy resources uh, in the next chapter, like wind and like solar uh, and things like that. So there is the controversy, of course, about the future of nuclear power. Again, nuclear reactors produced about 19% of the energy here in the U.S. in 2014. Uh, 67 new nuclear reactors were under construction worldwide in 2015. The U.S. government does provide subsidies, tax breaks, and insurance to the nuclear industry. But unfortunately, accidents have dampened public confidence in the nuclear power. Again, the Fukushima uh, accident uh, just about 10 years ago or so now. Uh, again, uh, you know, again, it dampened uh, a public confidence. We had some issues in Pennsylvania uh, back in the 80s, uh, uh, the Chernobyl plant in, in Russia back in the 80s as well. But I would also argue that was many years ago. And, and the, uh, the safety now of these newer nuclear plants, uh, nuclear power plants are actually much better uh, than they were, obviously, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we have new technologies. So advanced light water reactors are out there with built-in safety features. We have smaller modular light water reactors, not yet built and evaluated, but that could help as well because they're going to be much, much cheaper, uh, much, much cheaper to build. And you might be able to, if you if they're smaller and they're modular, you kind of move them around. Maybe you can get them in some uh, underdeveloped nations to help those folks. Uh, or we have something called thorium-based reactors, which is, again, just another, uh, you know, uranium, thorium, just some more elements uh, and they're less costly and they're safer. So uh, some of the new technologies coming out may help us out. So what are some solutions? Well, reactors must be built so that a runaway chain reaction is impossible. That's that nuclear meltdown we spoke about. The reactor fuel and methods of fuel enrichment and fuel reprocessing must be such that they cannot be used to make nuclear weapons. So you don't want uh, the leftovers of this stuff to be able then to be used by, by rogue nations uh, to potentially produce weapons. Spent fuel and dismantled plants must be easy to dispose of without burdening future generations with harmful radioactive waste. We need to take its entire fuel, fuel cycle into account. Nuclear power must generate a net high energy uh, or net energy high enough so that it does not need government subsidies, tax breaks, or loan guarantees to compete in the open marketplace. And right now it doesn't. Uh, again, right now there's it's a low, uh, low net energy uh, nuclear plant. So in order for these nuclear plants to make money, we need the government to give subsidies, tax breaks, and loans. Well, we, we don't need that. We need to be able to figure out uh, how to, if we're going to continue to use nuclear power, that we need to take the whole fuel cycle into account and we need to make it cheap enough so that the net energy yield is high enough that these companies do not need government uh, influx of money and subsidies to make them to make them profitable. And uh, its entire fuel cycle must generate fewer greenhouse gas emissions than other energy alternatives like our wind and our solar, uh, et cetera. OK, so if we can if we can figure out these solutions, then there may be a future to, to a nuclear power that, that, that is an environmentally uh, effective way to, uh, to provide people with energy in the future. But again, we have to deal with these one, two, three, four, five issues, and we have to find these five solutions uh, in order to get uh, a nuclear power to be at the forefront. Okay, so Core case study. Here it is: the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant accident. Again, March 11, 2000, uh, uh, March 11, 2011, which is almost about 10 years now. Triggered by a major offshore earthquake and the resulting tsunami. So the tsunami came in and uh, basically uh, got into the nuclear power plant. And, and unfortunately, uh, there were some important effects. And what were those effects? Well, it increased the fear about nuclear power. It revealed a single accident can cost 500 billion dollars to clean up. Some countries announced phasing out nuclear power after this happened. Maybe a knee-jerk reaction, maybe not. Uh, and it spurred Japan to reduce its energy use. Okay, so these were some of the effects of this, of this uh, uh, Fukushima disaster uh, that occurred almost 10 years ago. So again, is nuclear fusion the answer? So now, uh, as we kind of go off, we kind of are going back to the nuclear fusion, which is maybe the answer is combining 
uh, elements together instead of pulling them apart. Right now, it's nuclear fission that runs our nuclear plants, pulling atoms apart, our elements apart. But fusion, putting them back together, maybe this is the answer. So in fusion, two isotopes are fused together to form a heavier nucleus. It That releases energy. And this is technology used by the sun to release energy. So the point is, this is how the sun does it. Uh, these are how stars do it by nuclear fusion. So if we can emulate that and find technology uh, that kind of is like what the sun does, well, maybe that's going to be the answer. However, that technology is very difficult to develop. No approach has produced more energy than it has used at this point. So at this point, it takes more energy to produce energy via nuclear fusion. Uh, and as a result, it's not worth it. OK, it's not because it's going to cost you more to, to, to make it than to use it. Uh, so it, it's, it's not going to be worth for anyone to do. So maybe this is something for you. I always like to point out uh, where the where the new generation can come in. Maybe this is something that will spark an interest in one of you guys. And maybe one of you guys will be able to figure out how to uh, how to create energy via nuclear fusion in a cheap way that makes it uh, an effective way to uh, to produce electricity for the world. Maybe someone uh, maybe someone that I know, one of you guys, uh, will be able uh, will be able to find this answer. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it here. So let's go through the last big ideas. I think it's just three slides left here. So the big ideas of this chapter: net energy. All right, is the key factor in evaluating the long term usefulness of any energy resource. You want to get that high net energy. Okay, conventional oil, natural gas, and coal, plentiful with moderate to high net energy yields, but unfortunately, their use has a high environmental impact. So there's the, there's the issue, okay? Oil, gas, coal, great, great energy yields, but terrible environmental impact. Nuclear power, kind of the opposite. Nuclear power has very low environmental impact, but has also a very low uh, net energy yield, okay? Because it costs a lot of money to produce, okay? What are some other downsides? Long-lived radioactive waste with your nuclear power, and again, the role in spreading nuclear weapons technology. So we tie it all together with this final slide, fracking, non-renewable energy, and sustainability. So once again, we talked about that fracking uh, earlier in, 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 uh, in the first part of this lecture. Horizontal drilling and fracking have greatly increased oil and natural gas production here in the U.S. Uh, Long-term usefulness of an energy resource depends on its net energy. Again, we want it to be high. What's our challenge? Find ways to reduce harmful environmental impacts of fossil fuels and nuclear energy. And how do we do it? We shift to more renewable energy resources. And that is going to come in the next chapter, chapter 15. All right, folks, I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, chapter uh, 14 here, talking about non-renewable energy resources. And as is always the case... Thanks for listening.